Well, hi, everybody. My name is Elisa Camahort page um, here, I'm from here in the Bay Area. I was one of the three co-founders of BlogHer, um, which was acquired by She Knows Media about three years ago. And then um, I just left there. As of June 30th, I am 100% free after 12 years. So I'm having my existential crisis right here with you all. Um, and now I'm working on my first book and consulting and all that good stuff. And I am here with three super impressive women. And we are not going to recite our bios for you because that would be boring. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is tell each of you, each of us will tell you a little bit about how many careers we've had and how many times we've completely transformed um, to get to where we are today. Uh, and I think that that'll give you a sense of how different you know, things are than maybe they were several decades ago where people, certainly we learned this lesson in Silicon Valley that there's no job for life anymore. And we learned it pretty in a pretty hard way about 17 years ago or so during the dot-com bust. Um, so this is what I consider my fifth career. I was living in New York, pursuing a starving artist life. I mean, I, I wasn't pursuing being starving, but that was just, <laughs> that was the side benefit. Um, <clears throat> and when I didn't like that anymore, I moved back to California, and I worked in the commodities industry for seven years, and I did accounting when I was a math-phobic student in, in high school and university. Um, then I got into hardware and networking systems and high tech. Then I got into the internet, land of the internet. Then I started my first company over the age of 40. And now I'm having that existential crisis and figuring out what's next. And in each of these cases, it was driven not by I want to go, you know, this is the next thing I want to do. It was like, where was the opportunity for me? Where was the life that I wanted? Um, and where, what gave me the most mobility and flexibility? So as an example of that, um, commodities is based in New York and Chicago mostly. And so I knew when I wanted to leave the job I had here that my job mobility was really bad because there weren't a lot of companies dealing with that. So I'm like, hey, I hear this high tech thing is kind of important here in Silicon Valley. Um, so I just said, let me give it a shot and see if it works out. And that's kind of each time I was like, I am not, this is not the life and the lifestyle I want right now. What could get me closer to that? And I don't, some of those things seem like really big reinventions, but I consider it all an evolution of the kind of life I want, which is about I can figure out anything as long as it's getting me closer to that. So that's why I consider this my fifth career. Um, and we all know now that I'm 53. And Christina, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what career you're in? Um, hi, my name's Christina Mancini Jones. Um, and on fifth or sixth, I don't, I've, <laughs> I've lost track. I've uh, been a creative executive my entire career until recently I've moved into technology. My first job was on the lot of Warner Brothers, and I've worked in entertainment ever since. Um, and whether it's been in home entertainment as an art director and marketing, international or domestic, launching the franchise. Uh, group for the for the film studio and now technology. I guess it's been um, not an obvious path, but a path that was carved out by my interest, just kind of following what I was curious about at the time. Um, so, uh, if you follow like what's happening in media, it's been incredibly disruptive by technology. So that's how I ended up finding myself on this side, trying to understand how we can leverage technology um, technology to drive. Uh, both the business and the um, story around our, our product. Avita. Hey. <laughs> so um, my career path has been circular, actually. I started as a lawyer um, back in Israel, and then um, when I moved, I decided to start a new career as a businesswoman, and then there was this spark in me that was persistent and eventually I had to listen to it and went back to be a lawyer again uh, here in the United States. And yes, I, I wish I had the, you know, the, the technology that exists right now, such as biometrics to tell me, listen, Vital, lawyer is <laughs> what you need to be. This is your true self, your true passion. 
Well, I was telling Avital I was so excited to have her on this panel because the, the customary narrative is about all the people leaving things like lawyer, being lawyers or accountants or whatever to pursue their passion or dream. And we don't hear the other side, which is there are, my brother is a lawyer here in San Francisco and he's, he loves it, you know. And so there, I love the circular path back to that. Maybe the rest of us who are, a lot of us are probably creatives, like we're like, people do that? And we're like, yes, people do. And Maggie. Hi, I'm Maggie Learn. I come from NerdWallet most recently. And to the question of which career I'm on, I'm having my third, fourth, and fifth career at the same time. Wow. <laughs> Do explain. So I originally started in newsrooms, in newspapers, and that was uh, something I decided to do as a kid. And I figured it was not a real legit job, but really fun, and you could Get earn, uh, you could earn money doing it, and I was amazed you could make a living doing it. Uh, but the business model started crumbling, and I decided to branch out to other platforms. So I went from newspapers to CNN, uh, which doesn't seem like that much of a stretch, but in reality, it was really a big jump. It was going from a very linear sort of process to essentially going to uh, being waterboarded every day. And, and it was really fun, but uh, it was a huge jump uh, for me and a lot of the people who made that transition. And uh, that was going well, and they offered me a promotion to something, and I figured I could either take that promotion and end up in a place I didn't want to end up and give up a job I already liked, and I didn't see the value of doing that. So, but I also wanted to keep learning. So I started looking around and trying to figure out where my skills would apply best. And I eventually created what was my ideal job description. And based on that, then I went to look in the universe to see where that might exist. And so I ended up finding a startup that looked very promising after I had done months of research triangulating what a startup should look like ideally. So I found the company, but the job was wrong. So I basically decided I was gonna apply, sell myself, and if they liked me and I liked them, I would tell them the real job I wanted. So, so I did that. So I made up my own job. And so I joined when it was about 45 people, and the company is now more than 300 people. And so I built a content operation from scratch in a startup. But one of the things about having a different career is really like uh, understanding that the things that you learn can be applicable in other places, but there are also things that you have to give up and change and learn how to adapt. And I think that was super important for me. And one of the things that I have learned uh, since joining NerdWallet is that I am super passionate about helping people develop their careers. That was always something I liked doing, but I'm actually getting a much bigger uh, chance to have that kind of influence throughout the company. And so my fourth, fifth career, uh, one of them is being a coach, an executive coach, and I do that throughout the company, work with people who are middle managers as well, and I also do it for other startups. And so the fifth job is I've been asked to do advisory work in the startup world as well. So it's a lot of fun, uh, nothing I really imagined, but uh, extremely fulfilling. And I think that's the most important thing is to find something that is fulfilling to you one way or the other. Yeah, thank you. So you can see a lot of different reasons for the evolution of the different things we're searching for. I just wanna ask some more questions of you all. How many of you are on the same career? You're doing what you thought you were gonna do when you left school and anybody? All right. Wow, okay, so how many are on career number two or three? Okay, how many of you are like, it sounds like most of us, which is career four, five, six, and beyond? Yeah, it's so, so common. Um, how many of you are from this area? Yeah, I, wow, so a lot of people came in for it. That's awesome. I, I remember after the bust happened in 2000 and things started to go downhill, 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 that's when I started to realize that everybody I met had a side hustle because they had realized that no job was ever permanent or loyal, really. How many of you have a side hustle? Oh, y'all gotta work on your side hustles. <laughs> um, and how many of you would say that you have primarily, your job changes have been tr primarily about figuring out what you wanted to do next? And you're just trying, in other words, trying things, seeing if they fit. Not too many. How many of you jumped when you figured it out and you were, I mean, I'm so impressed by Maggie's, like she researched the company, she found the one company that she wanted to work at. I mean, that's amazing. Anybody else that, um, that's, I find that impressive, Maggie. Can I add one thing? Yeah. I, I thought that that was really relevant, what you said. I, 
I think, um, I know there's more of a startup mentality out here. In Hollywood, there's not quite as many startups, but within um, the entertainment group, I've been at Fox for 16 years, and I'm currently writing my third job description. So it is possible, even if you are within a company, if you see a need, fill it. So instead of waiting for somebody to tap you to say, like, we think that you're awesome enough to try this new thing, I think it's important to like raise your hand and uh, show them why you should be doing it. And it's crazy that they're not doing it already. So that was a great point. How many of you have done something similar? Like basically pitched? Yeah, I think that's, that's common in not just here, but like you said, in a lot of places. And especially in big companies. My sister worked for HP for years and years. And they were very actually committed to moving people around and learning different disciplines, learning different businesses. So that is one of the benefits that can that be of a company like that. Um, you know, the thing I wanted to talk about is there's two cliches you hear when it comes to age. The first is you hear sometimes out of the mouth of babes, right? And like that there's this wisdom in the fresh perspective. And I think especially in tech and here in Silicon Valley, there's a definite cult of, you know, the millennials and hiring young. Uh, but the other thing you hear is with age comes wisdom and experience. Um, and what I find is that you want to do a little of both. You want to recognize the wisdom you've developed by your years of experience, but you don't want to get too far away from some of the, some of the stuff you learned when you were just looking at things with fresh eyes. How do you, um, and any one of you can start, like what are some of the lessons that you learned early in your career that you still try to leverage even as you've gotten very experienced? Well, uh, I'll start off here. For me, it is really what don't I know? That, that was really important in journalism. It continues to be important as I'm transitioning and trying new roles. And I think that uh, when I look back at the people who weren't successful at making transitions, either on my team or elsewhere that I've seen, the thing that was consistent was people who thought, I know what I'm doing. And they just came with this really sort of rigid or fixed idea of what things should be like, rather than taking in more of what's around you, what the context is, learning from amazing people of all generations. And I think that's really something that applies to all careers, all fields. I think Maggie and I are gonna be friends. <laughs> we keep saying, the same version of that for me is uh, just to remain curious. It doesn't matter how far along you get in your career, you absolutely don't know everything. And there's people that are further along that no more, and there's people who are just entering with fresh eyes that you should be tapping into. So just, um, I have a deep curiosity. I'm always reading a lot. Um, I think it's important to continue to do that and to foster that. And I guess the other thing that, um, on the other side of the age issue is I'm, I'm grateful to be older because I think it's important that you learn to not listen to the stories in your head and just to go ahead and if you feel passionate about something, you should go ahead and try it as opposed to coming up with the 800 reasons why it's, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. I would throw out one that, uh, you know, I, I try not to get too far away from remembering what it was like to be the junior employee who was ambitious and scrappy and wanted to advance. I think a lot of times if you've been managing for a long time, um, not only do you understand more about management's perspective and why some things have to be the way they are, but you forget how the little things matter. You forget how the opportunities, you know, that you don't give out, someone's out there wishing they could have. And I guess you lose a little empathy, I think. So that was, for me, the most important thing as I sort of started managing bigger and bigger teams was to remember when I was the one who was super interested in becoming, you know, moving from a project coordinator to a product manager to a, you know, all those steps up the ladder um, as an ambitious person. And I found you can really retain people much better if you <laughs> remember what it was like, you know, all the way along. Um, so that would be one for me. Avital, did you um, have one? Yeah, I wanted to tap into what Christina said about um, basically getting things done, finding solutions rather than finding all the different excuses of why you cannot do something. And this is something I learned throughout my career that this is the one thing that would really propel you forward and you help you succeed. You know, you several of you mentioned that. Do you think that's an age or experience thing? I mean, I feel like I've met people in my career who are kind of no people or yes people, no matter how old they are. 
Like I've met young people who are no people. <laughs> That's their first answer, and then you got to convince them they can get to yes. Um, what are like? Do you do you think there are stereotypes around, about your generation or other generations that? Uh, what are your pet peeves? Like what really bugs you? Well, for me, it's for people making generalizations. Um, they see you as the group you belong to, and that group can be one of many. It can be women, um, it can be um, you know, the, your national origin, your religion, the way you look, it can be many, or your age <laughs> uh, for our p panel. And then all of a sudden they have a list of, of traits and, and skills and characteristics that they immediately attach to you. And every person is much greater than the, the sum of the, of the people of the group they belong to. And this is really one of my strongest pet peeves. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel, like how is that, what has someone made an assumption about you about? Um, my age. <laughs> and um, actually, <laughs> One of, the, one of the most annoying stories uh, from the, when I just started my career as a lawyer, and there was this uh, CFO that I worked for, and he was just insistent in getting my age. And I said, this is really irrelevant. <laughs> it's not, like if you have any concern about the, the work or about the legal matter that we're discussing, I will be happy to talk it out, but my age is really none of your business. It totally reminds me of the time I made an appointment with our CEO to ask why I didn't get the promotion, which I was never going to get at that company, I found out. Um, and his first question to me was, how old are you? And I knew he was going to ask me because I knew what sort of person he was. Um, and so I said, I'm three years older than you were when you founded this company and became its CEO. <laughs> and... <laughs> Then he asked me how I kept my skin so nice and young. So you, you get the idea, right? But um, yeah, I find that, uh, not that it got me the job, but that's why I left and that's why I ended up founding my own company. So I guess I should say thank you uh, to him. Uh, anybody else have an assumption or pet peeve about? Stereotypes obviously are a pet peeve for me. That's why I started off with the, it's important to not listen to the stories in your own head because then it's really easy to accept the stories that people are trying to um, stick on you. And I mean, obviously I don't bother trying to blend in because this is who I am. I'm a creative executive. I'm half Jamaican, I'm half Italian, exactly. I'm half Italian, I'm a storyteller, and I'm comfortable in my skin, and it's not up to me to make you comfortable with me being there. Um, so as I've moved along in my career, I've tried to make sure that I create a space where it's possible for other people to feel like they're also um, able to be comfortable in themselves. Uh, we've been having a lot of conversations in Hollywood, probably he here, I'm not sure, sorry, I'm from Los Angeles, around inclusion. And one of my favorite TED Talks is from Brene Meyer, um, and she talks about the difference between diversity and inclusion, and she says, um, diversity is being asked to the dance, and inclusion is being asked to dance. And that can only happen when you feel like you're part of the team. And so why hire somebody like myself or any of us on the panel if what you're looking for is a cookie cutter solution? Do you have a question? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that um, here in Silicon Valley, there's obviously a lot of conversation about diversity and inclusion. Um, but it's very, I still think it's pretty one-dimensional. Um, it's not looking at all the aspects. Um, you know, I know a lot of people who are deathly afraid of losing their job because they're over 50, and they don't think they'll get another one no matter what their um, capabilities are and what their bona fides are. And, um, or for instance, you know, disability. Are we talking about that today? And, you know, as I climbed the stairs, to get up here, I wondered, um, you know, if we're thinking about the full range, I think it's, it's, and I think there's a common perception about Silicon Valley, which is pretty accurate, which is that diversity has meant white women. Um, 
And uh, so <laughs> that's really, that's not sufficient, clearly. Um, by the way, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot to say that the hashtag for this is supposed to be disrupt aging, if you're tweeting anything about um, what we're saying, disrupt aging. Um, and I was supposed to say that at the beginning. Do you have a question back there? Well, Mark Hurd did, so I guess he probably could. No, but, but, no, but, I mean, but you know what I mean? Like, that, that I think that that's real. And what do we do? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly when I was saying. When I, and how do we, how do we how do people break this cycle? Like, how do we deal with it? Because here's the thing. The one of the, and Christina, I know you have a question. So just a second. Exactly, that's what I was saying. The people I know who are over 50, including people very close to me who are white men, don't want to lose their jobs because they're afraid they won't get another one as programmers. I'm talking about like engineering and programming. Um, and the, mis the misconception is it's because just because older people cost more. But if you look at how much they're paying a junior engineer to start at Google, this is not a cost. This is not a cost thing. They pay those people a lot of money no matter how old they are. Um, it is about thinking that if you're older, you either won't keep up or you won't, all your, like, you know, the famous thing about mathematicians all got their Nobel Prizes when they were young and things like that. Uh, and I thought one of the best things I ever saw written about this was, um, and I'm going to get his name wrong, it was after that James Daymore letter to Google about um, the downside of diversity, I guess I'll politely call it. And a, an engineer named Jonathan... I think it's Zanger. Does anyone know Zanger? Yes. He wrote an amazing piece about the, f the he could tell this guy was junior because he considered engineering to be writing code. But programming and engineering is about communicating, advocating, evangelizing, problem solving, but it's all communal. You know, there is the time when the engineer works alone at his laptop or her laptop and codes, but there's all the rest of the time where they're having you know, debates and discussions and all of that. And if you can get your ideas conveyed, and you get better at that with age, typically, and you understand that more about the job, typically, as you go along in experience. So, um, you know, that, but I, I know that Christina wanted to say something, but I wanted to say I agree with you that it, it's a definite issue. I don't necessarily think it's an elephant. I think it's part of what we're here to talk about. I haven't really, a lot of places, they won't talk about it. So yeah. Maybe you should I, start there. I think the I think the it's the talk about laying in the bed you've created. <laughs> um, I think that it is absolutely impossible to have a conversation about diversity and inclusion and take them bit by bit. So if the people who are founding these companies are of a certain age, um, they're not going to find value maybe in people that are of an older age. You guys can turn off my mic and kick me out because I don't work in, t in Silicon Valley. But what I will tell you is that I work in Hollywood and there's not ageism there behind the camera, definitely in front because I'm like way over the hill for a 60 year old man at this point. So, but as it relates to the executive suite, um, it's people have been there for a long time and they kind of do like the, the musical chairs. So you don't see the ageism as it occurs here. I'm always curious to watch how it happens because if you have like uh, younger people starting companies that don't understand, and it's mostly like one type of 
one man starting a company. There's a reason they call those companies unicorns because it's actually super, super rare that a 20 something in a hoodie form, founds and builds and creates a billion dollar company. The average founder of success startups with exits is actually older, but it's like, it's, it's a myth actually. It's kind of mythology. Um, so do you think that they're trying to recruit for more unicorns, or like, like what is the? Because I, it's it's hard for me as an outsider to watch the conversations that happen, and then it's not just like the age thing. It's like funny for me to watch like the race thing. It's like, but we're doing, got all these women, and it, we're working on that. We're, we're, we're doing all this and we're going to deal with the age thing. It's, no, but you're not looking at like the whole picture because if you have a more inclusive workforce, um, there's cultures who find value in elders and like the wisdom that comes with them. Um, there's different people who find value in um, looking around the room and seeing a more diverse um, group sitting around the table because you know that if you don't, you're only going to get one side of the story. How can you tell stories that only come from one perspective? So again, that's just my thought, but I, I just I, I I have like a little knee jerk reaction when I hear people trying to like pe pull pieces out because I don't think you can look at things like that unless you're looking at a whole picture. Um, I I also feel similarly that. Somehow diversity and inclusion is the only area in business, again, where saying, oh, there are many problems, I have so many excuses, um, is acceptable. In no other area of business you can tell your, your boss or your advisor, oh, there are so many, tr so many problems. It's hard. It's, it's hard. <laughs> You just get it done. You find there are solutions. There are technologies that, that can help. There are many things that you can do inside the company, outside the company. Uh, it's just unacceptable, uh, just as much as it's unacceptable, again, in any other area. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything that's been said to date. The, the main thing is people are not going to do it because it's good, the right thing to do. The main thing is people are going to do it if they see that there's a competitive advantage. But the data has been it. out there. That's my question, right? The yeah. data has been out there that companies with more diversity in their C-suite mm -hmm. and even in their engineering room have better results in their, on their board. That data is there. That's not enough. So the question is, mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like we should go full Scandinavia. And I'm like, <laughs> quote us, quote us. Because well, if, once you get the people in the room, it changes the dynamic and it changes things. I know lots Lots of people are uncomfortable with that. But I'm like, you know, we've got the data. We've got that it's the right thing to do. We've got that it's a problem. We all want to solve it. And yet here we are. I don't think a, a one, there's going to be one solution. I think it is going to be, you know, many efforts. So one of the things that makes me hire diversely is when I worked, when I was really young, I, I had peers who are at least 20 years older than me. And they treated me like a human being as a professional, not as some kid. And they helped me along. That's, you know, a really impressionable age at the very start of your career. So when I think about that now, I try to create that kind of team where people are multi-generational and there is back and forth with younger people helping older people and vice versa. And I think that actually imprints on people over time. It is not something that's gonna get done overnight, but showing the results over and over again, as well as showing that it is actually a good experience. But I will tell you, when uh, you, the little lady was asking about how you talk about you know, ageism in tech, uh, I work for people who are millennials and uh, when I first went to interview at NerdWallet, uh, I found out later somebody said on the team of uh, the executives who had interviewed me, every single person was at least 15 years my junior. I found out after I hired somebody said, pretty cool for an oldie. <laughs> and so I, I called that out. I was like, hey guys, thanks for hiring me, despite my age, but just so you know, I can kick all your asses. You know, and I explained why. <laughs> You know, not just, you know, because I had been around longer, but like, here are the things I can add to the team value-wise. And here are other people who can add different types of value. And so now our team, uh, my team is uh, about 80-some people. 30% are 50 or older. And there is a good representation across the, the, the team. This is super important because it isn't going to be fought with just one bullet. It is going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat, all of us talking about it, showing results, giving people good experiences. And don't be the curmudgeon that ruins it for everybody. There are few enough of us in the room that we don't want to be the asshole that makes the bad impression. 
for everybody else. I think that's super important. Like that Dan Lyons guy, I want to kill him. You know, he just like ruined it for so many people because his, you know, terrible attitude toward how to, you know, whether he was a fit for that company or not that he blew up essentially isn't the question. The question is, do you know yourself well enough and do you know what you can bring to a situation? And if it's not the right situation, don't shit all over it, you know. Love you so much. But I, you know, <laughs> but I, I think we do a disservice on the other end of the spectrum too, though, because, and I think if we could get rid of it on across the spectrum, it would help. How many of you have heard how much about how millennials are entitled and they don't want to work hard and they only care about X, Y, and Z? And it's total bullshit. Thank you, Regina. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I had some amazing millennial people working for me who were hardworking, get her done, like just wanted to know what they could do. Yes, they were ambitious. And here's the thing. Why, when millennials are asking for work conditions that those of us who fought for years for, um, why aren't we happy that they get them? Why aren't we happy? Because that goes across the whole workforce. Like we, we begrudge, like you should pay your dues like I did, but I hated paying my dues. So, you know, I... Um, and I feel like once we start dividing people up in any way, it just opens the door. If you're going to think all millennials are like this, then it's fair to say all, you know, boomers are like that. And, you know, I would submit that millennials don't want to work in open office plans. They just never have had their own office yet. <laughs> and if they did, especially if they're a programmer or a writer, they would be like, don't ever send me back to a pod. Um, and that whole Apple campus is going to be all open a platform, and I think they're, I think it's insanity. Your, your dark ways are spreading to Hollywood. We're all losing our offices now. It's insanity. <laughs> it's hard. I have a question. How many in here um, have the ability to hire? So, right. So what are you guys doing to disrupt the narrative that's in here? Do, you, do any of your companies have rules about what the candidate pool has to look like before you can start interviewing? Because some companies here are starting to do that, and I think it's good. Some big internship program, unless you have some big internship program that you're hiring like 5,000 people into it, most of the hires made at a very large tech company are made by an individual who desperately needs someone in there to do that job as fast as possible. Because of that, the, the data means nothing to that hiring manager. The, the only manager that I've had that ever gave a shit about diversity was before I went, got into tech, back when I worked in retail banking. When I worked in retail banking, my manager said, what does your talent pool look like for this job, and is it a diverse talent pool? Um, when I got into tech, and I've never come up once in all but, those times. But that's the choice that tech has made. Absolutely. Because, uh, oh, our work is so important and world-changing that we just need the best. We don't need to, my favorite thing on earth, sacrifice quality for diversity, which is a my... A absolutely, absolutely. But also, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to get a... Um, diverse talent pool unless you ask for it. You Correct. have to ask for it. Correct. And what the tech companies are doing, they can report data all they want. You can look at their composition of the C-suite. This is all important stuff. But what really matters is they need to have a culture that runs up and down through the company that actually that values that. That means it has to be... It how, ha co how come... It has to be policy. How, yes. But, but what about almost everybody raised their hand here and everyone can hire here. So how come... Right. We're not doing it. It would be like if I was casting a movie and I was just saying, I, there's no older women in any movies, but I would only like to cast for 25 and under. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that it's probably a little complicated, but well, we if might be also a self-selected crowd here attending a diversity and inclusion conference. But let's, let's talk about like what do... What have we all personally done? Let's give some examples of personal, and I don't just mean professionally, where you want a talent pool that's diverse and you think about the makeup of your team, which I have done and said I need someone 
you know, who's not like everybody else on my team, I specifically need to go find that person. Um, but also in my personal, like, what are the right, who are the writers I follow? Who do I read? What movies do I see? What culture do I expose myself to? And am I being diverse there? And I see a ton of questions, and, and we'll get over there in a second. Um, what, what's just one thing so we can get over, and we have a lot of time left, actually. What's one thing each of you have done to, like, personally instill diversity and inclusion in both your working life and your personal life? I, I think I, I would be amiss if I didn't put in a shameless plug, but only because I truly believe in it. What we do, our company, Pymetrics, this is exactly what we do. We help companies uh, help select top talent that is bias-free. And this is the, the bottom line is that it's possible. We, there's enough advancement in technology that we can do with that. We, the only thing is that we need to decide that that's um, a priority, but also from the, the other side, you know, we have different types of clients. We have the clients that want that diverse pool, but we also have the clients that want the top talent. We also have clients that want to- They're not mutually exclusive. Increase efficiency, exactly. And they all get the benefit of all three levels. But, and so how diverse is the team programming this unbiased tool? I mean, that would be, like my initial question would be at the in the beginning at the end of the day beginning of the day all day long it's humans that are creating yeah. all, like the algorithm the Facebook's algorithm is not unbiased right so, so we first of all our company is extremely <laughs> diverse because it's very important for us but we are aware of that we know that many people say well when you use an algorithm there's no unconscious bias because it's not a human but it's not true because humans are coding that algorithm. And also humans are used for the baseline for the algorithm. When we talk about AI and machine learning, we have the baseline, the training set. That can be extremely uh, one-sided and, and very non-diverse. So we know that you have to extract the, the bias actively. You have to do that. You have to look for that and you have to remove that. Otherwise, you will never reach the results that you look for. Yeah, the common theme I'm hearing is intention. Okay, let's take a question and I'll go back to you on your personal actions right there. can definitely be manipulated and changed and work with. And in fact, that's why there's whole Medium articles or wherever it is articles about how you can study to ace the Google interview or whatever interview you want. And so the thing is that how do we, how does that benefit people and how can we get people who are older, whatever, whatever intersectional um, you want to, label you want to put on so that we can all ace through it or we can get those jobs appropriately because just because I can uh, memorize how to pass this interview so that I can get into this engineering job isn't a good indication of me as a worker is it yeah I feel like if if I were if I were a company that had that kind of interview process, which I never really did have that kind of interview process, why wouldn't you publish what the process is so that people could come in at their best? I mean, even amongst people's best, some people are going to be better fit than other fit and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it's just like um, that to me would be the first step is that there should be transparency. Um, yeah. With that. So Natalia from Pipeline Angels. So one of the things that resonated about this talk for me was the, the title, Mythbusters. And so I mentioned earlier, um, our members are investing in more voices. We now have a, over 40 portfolio companies and over 40% are founders that are 40 years and older. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is because we're talking about hiring and another aspect of it in the tech world is also talking about who is starting you know, companies. And the that's the myth that I wanted to bust, you know, in terms of like, hey, there are older people who are also starting companies and we need to also focus on that. And so my question to the panel is, I'd love for each of you to share one myth that you want to bust for the room. Who wants to start? Who wants to bu bust a myth? I would have to, you start first. <laughs> oh, did you have a question? Uh, so, uh, 
this is, I'm not sure if this is exactly the answer you're looking for, but what I recognized uh, after starting at NerdWallet, and there, it was about three months down the, um, down the path, and somebody came up with an idea that I realized that I should have come up with. And I thought to myself, well, okay, it's not a genius idea, but I should have come up with it anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought, why didn't I come up with it? And I realized that it, over the years, whether I worked at big companies or media outlets, et cetera, I had put up certain barriers in my own head about what I could and couldn't do, what was my place and what wasn't my place. And just keeping that in mind, if you think of a dog behind an electric fence, the electric fence could be off, but once the dog is trained, they probably won't go running toward it because they know there's consequences. I think that's really important for all of us, no matter what our age, no matter what our backgrounds, et cetera, to, uh, to Christina's point about eliminating that negative dialogue or at least talking yourself out of that dialogue and having somebody sane talk to you and recognize your value and your, the way that you can contribute so that if you're a journalist, you don't think this is the only way I could you know, be useful. Or if I'm in tech, you know, the people must be hired so they can solve my immediate problem and not think wider about what else could they bring to this company. To me, that is more important than anything else. When you, you know, when you build a business or, you know, try to hire a team, it is really about all the ingredients that you could bring to that effort, not about filling little squares. That's the thing I hate the most, that people think that people have to fit into little squares of some sort, rather than think, taking into account all the things that people could contribute, could, could be contributing and adding that to the mix. I think that's super important for all of us because in our day-to-day -day interactions, whether it's at work, whether you're in charge of hiring or not, you can help push those boundaries and help other people to think more creatively. Who else got a myth to bust? Uh, that the only person that can be a senior ranking executive in a tech company is some white dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm an executive vice president in technology. I report to the CIO and the CTO of 21CF. I'm not. 21st Century Fox. <laughs> yeah, sorry, 21st Century Fox. I'm not a white man in a hoodie. I'm not, I'm, I know it's weird. I'm not, <laughs> I'm also, not below 40. I mean, and I just made this career change uh, about a year ago. So um, when you're not Lady inclusive, busted myth. yeah, when you're not inclusive of, you know, the, of, uh, when you don't have an inclusive workforce and you don't have an inclusive mentality, you miss out on talent that is not obvious, right? So Luckily for me, I work inside of Fox and I was interested in the position and I wrote my job description and they created a role for me. I used to report to our, our chairman. I developed a passion for technology. I moved over. Um, but what recruiter, ma'am, <laughs> would you ever have put me up for my job? Probably not, because I don't really fit the right mold, but I'm actually really good at my job. So uh, that's why I kept asking you guys as you, as you go out and you hire, um, you need to like look outside the box. When they were looking to hire more inclusively at Fox, it was hard to even find a talent pool to hire from because the agencies weren't recruiting them either. So it's a pipeline. A lot of it gates. Although I will say, to be honest, here in Silicon Valley, so much of the hiring is done by first degree of separation, maybe second degree of separation. HR does their thing, but you got to find the person you know. What about you, Avital Deva? Yeah, I, I think the main myth for me is that pedigree is worth anything for recruiting purposes. That's the because myth. Because it, it means nothing. It doesn't matter what school you went to. It doesn't matter, again, what group you be belong to, uh, how old you are. It is your inherent potential skills and knowledge that would make you either a top-notch um, employee or, or a low performer, and that's it. And there is a bit of the cult of MIT, Stanford, Cal here. I will say that's my, so my myth, and then I see some questions. My myth, um, I got told this a lot when I was in traditional tech before I founded BlogHer, um, that I managed like a man. And that meant that I was forthright, that I was decisive, that I was straightforward all these things. And then I would say, so you think that those, those are good qualities, right? Those are, that's when people were praising me. They'd be like, yeah. I'm like, so you think that those qualities are 
typically or normally male and therefore unusual in a woman. Is that what you're saying? Because if you're hiring people and someone walks in your door for a management position and that's your mindset, um, don't tell me there isn't some implicit bias right there when that person walks in the door that you think they could be a manager or not a manager. So I have a vagina. I am not a man. And I manage the way I manage. And that, there's my busted myth. Um, and that used to just drive me crazy because it was so explicit. It was so explicit. Manage like a man. Okay, someone had a question right there, and then we'll go over there. It's like age, whether it's like age of the people working on these projects or just age of the industry in general. For you guys, as people who have seen other industries, other careers, other jobs, are there things having to do with, you know, hiring and management and diversity and inclusion that you would like to borrow and see implemented in tech? Because we don't always need to re reinvent the wheel. One of the things that I borrowed from uh, one of the newsrooms I work in is I don't let managers do all the interviewing. I make sure that we have a panel of various people and they interview in pairs. One of the reasons for this is, um, so for instance, we will put two early career people in a room to interview a, uh, somebody, for instance, a senior writer. This is important because how they treat me is not how they treat other people. And this is one of the ways that we try to make sure that it's inclusive by hiring the kind of people who work well with everybody. So we're filtering out assholes, basically. Uh, <laughs> and we're actively trying to do that. And it's not a perfect science, but if, then if we catch that kind of behavior where it is you know, somehow divisive, then you either have to fix it or you have to leave. This is super important. We cannot tolerate bad behavior. I think this is really important across the landscape. Tolerance is not okay for certain things. Um, we're in Silicon Valley. Can't someone invent the perfect asshole filter? Because that would be awesome. <laughs> and by the way, I was just kind of an asshole when I was talking about being a woman, and I identified it by my body parts, which is not what makes a woman. So I apologize, because that was an asshole thing to say. Um, who else has something that they've seen works? I think providing opportunity. Um, I think one other myth um, to the lady in the back was that once you pick a box, you need to stay in it career-wise. I think that's kind of what we've all talked about up here a little bit is that just because you started in this, like, thank God I don't dress the way I did when I was 18, you know, but it's like you you change, you, you grow, you evolve, and um, maybe if what you're doing now isn't giving you the same passion, you always have the opportunity to jump into a new box or create a new box. Um, and then there's opportunity. Uh, one of the things that I did when I was at Fox, I managed our franchises. Women directors didn't have access to franchises. Um, so I was curious to see what I could do to um, add some value there and opportunity. So we partnered with the AFI Women Directors Lab and we created um, a partnership so that uh, women directors would have the opportunity to create additional world building materials to accompany our franchises. Um, that it's, it's, it seems obvious, but a lot of the time, and I think uh, what I hear here as well, is how do you actually even get the opportunity if things aren't even posted and it's one degree of separation, how do you tap back into a workforce, find new talent outside of your pond, um, I'm not sure what your solution is, but creating opportunity is Starts important. Starts with intent. I mean, that's, if there's one message I think that's pretty, you know, there's a theme here about it. It doesn't happen by magic. It happens through intent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, we talked about hiring. Now, once somebody's in the company, can you talk about more like what processes, procedures, models you have in place? Maggie, you alluded to it a little bit about how do you get that dynamic Can you repeat the question for the recording, too? Oh, okay. Oh, I can, I'll repeat it. He asked, what have you done once you have a, a multi-generational team to bring that team along to working together collaboratively in a successful way? There, there is no magic formula, unfortunately, but uh, the 
the fact is hiring the right people is actually a really great start. Everything else you can train people to you know, improve on, but if they don't have the right intent, that is super hard to change. Just, you know, that's been my experience. That, you know, there, you don't have to come in knowing how to do it all, but you have to have the intent of wanting to learn how. That's really important for us. I talk a lot, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think that if it's all magic and we have a inclusive workforce, all age, race, gender, um, it's still imperative that you are holding yourself accountable because you naturally self-select the people that you want to spend your time with. So it's easy for you to find yourself in little conversations in your office, lunch, drinks, whatever, where all of a sudden your inclusive workforce doesn't have access to the same information um, and opportunity that your dear friends do. Um, so what we try to do is we make note of the people that we do have in meetings um, and who's missing, right? Because you're not gonna, you don't do this on, no, I don't think anybody goes to work with malice, like I don't want any old people in my meeting, I don't want any black people in my meeting. I think, you know, I think people, you know, we're, everyone's trying, but you need to then, you know, change the way that you behave and it's a, a practice like everything else. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great point. Uh, to touch on that point. You want to be my friend too now. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> we are going to be very good friends. Uh, so that's an excellent point about um, sharing information. Uh, and this actually I didn't learn as part of inclusion necessarily. I had a boss who would tell people things one off. If you happen to be a friend of somebody or you happen to bump into them in somewhere and they happen to be in the mood to tell you, they would find out or you wouldn't find out. And just observing at the time, I realized like how bad and decisive that divisive that is as a manager. If you want your team to be whole and you know connected and feel like they're supporting each other, you cannot essentially divide people by selectively giving information and access. Yeah, I so don't care what generation important. people are. Everybody wants to know what their success factors are. Everybody wants to know what will make them successful, what will make the company successful, what will make a project successful. And they want to know your expectations as a manager. And they want to know if they're meeting them. And they don't want to wait till an annual review to find out. And those things, to me, are universal things that employees want to know. And if you start from that foundation, I think that you have a better shot of everybody's pulling the same direction. You have a question. Hi. Um, so I noticed that you said, like you asked how many people in the room had the ability to hire. And so I guess since we didn't, like hands went up, but we didn't hear a lot from them in terms of strategy. So I guess really my question to the panel is, maybe even outside of their hands, just suggestions that you have for people in terms of how we sort of help change the dynamic because the presumption that people actually want to change is probably not accurate because if they did, it would already be changed. So just strategies for individually how you, you know, negotiate and just kind of deal with the fact that um, you have to present yourself in a particular way or whatever to sort of change the equation. I, I think the gentleman, Eric, kind of brought it up a little bit where it's you don't really have a lot of time to look when you need to fill a position. It's like, well, who's in my circle? And who can I hire right now? I don't, I don't. This isn't really the time. Next time, I'm going to look for someone who's a little older, or different. Like today, I need to solve this problem for right now. So I think you need to. What we do is we work closely with our recruiter to make sure that um, they're part of our conversation. And uh, one of the things that, again. I, my personality, um, I moved over to tech. My first question to our tech recruiter was, why is the language so masculine? Like when you look at some of the job descriptions for women, it's like ninjas, rock stars, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm like, but it's still, you know, we're a storytelling company. You'd think that we would make more of an effort to even consider within the IT vertical who we're going after. So usually if we were in LA, he'd be here with me. Um, because when women or men, whatever, come up to speak afterwards, he takes cards and he does communicate with them. And we're trying to figure out a way to um, have some sort of version of a LinkedIn where even if you're like the not the candidate, like the next candidate, you don't lose track of them 
so that you can start building a community. Um, and one of my passions is it's not just about recruiting externally. I worry about internally. Um, at our company, we have a lot of legacy employees. Um, and uh, technology is giving them an opportunity to remain relevant in these times of change. It's disrupting us as much as anybody else, in some ways a lot worse. Um, but um, how are we doing a better job of kind of bringing them over the divide so that, and then pre um, creating a space where they can put their hat in the ring um, to try something different without any repercussions. So I think it's a 360 um, kind of approach. Tell you, you're probably not using a recruiter, so like, what are your strategies? I, again, I think using technology, because technology enables the hiring manager to tap into much larger pools. A hiring manager can review just so many resumes, and they j can go to just so many campuses. So they choose uh, the ones that they think would yield the best. Um, they go only to the Ivy League campuses, and they pay a lot of money to have their recruiters go there and start a career fair there, and they invest a lot of money in the students there. Um, however, there are many, many more um, campuses and colleges and universities um, just in the US, but also around the globe that they just don't tap into. So by using technology, you open the gateway from these 12 or 15 Ivy League school to um, 2,500, that, that's a number from one of our clients. It's just opening the doors and then you find, just by doing that, you find a much more diverse group, both on the ethnicity, gender, as well as uh, socioeconomic level. But what are the questions though? Because like, uh, to his point and to our point, if you had technology and you asked to give me the odds of a woman directing a tentpole franchise, it would say zero, because none have done it. Um, so, well, sorry, now we've got Wonder Woman, Maddie. Wonder Woman. right? Um, sorry, <laughs> different studio. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. But still admirable, still admirable. Um, That's but gracious. like, how, what, are the, thanks. What, are the, what are the questions to make sure that that, because if you haven't had someone be successful, I don't know what, I'm, I'm just asking, because I'm curious, like, what are the questions that is, are asked? Sure, so um, for, for once, we, we don't ask questions. We uh, use neuroscience-based games, uh, and they help to tap into the, the inherent core traits that the person has, the cognitive and personality traits. So um, not even the candidate themselves can harm their potential by limiting their self, by limiting um, you know, type of thinking. We, we have a lot of research around uh, self-confidence, how women are less confident, they only apply if they are 100% you know, confident that they meet the requirements, whereas men, they only 40% is good enough for them. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a generalization. Um, we have also with women coming, they're self-confident, they don't like to praise themselves. Um, and when you don't, when you're not asked, well, what can you do, what you're good at, you're just objectively showing what you can do. Then you really get um, a, a good and rich read on all the applicants. Well, it's an interesting thing you mentioned about women waiting till they have 100%. Something, I guess, a byproduct of our current political environment is that that used to be extremely true with women running for office, that they had to be asked a number of times before they would throw their hat in the ring and they would often, and I get this from talking to the founder of Vote Run Lead, which is one of the many organizations that's trying to get more women running for office. Um, and I guess as of a year ago, people think, wow, the bar has been lowered. I can run now. And that's why, <laughs> that's why like something like 22,000 women have signed up through these programs. To anyone, anyone running for office in here? Just curious. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
you know, that's something just I hope all of you will know, and I'll just, just since we're, we're wrapping up, and I will digress and tell you one of the, okay, one more question, but oh, one more question after. Um, so the, the book I'm working on is about everyday activism and getting more engaged in your own community and backyard, and people think politics is for the elite, but when it comes to your local and community, they're desperate for local participation. If you're living in San Francisco County or Santa Clara County and probably where you live too, they have these commissions, they have these committees. Most of them you don't run, you are appointed and you get appointed by being that one person who actually goes to three meetings in a row and they, you can find the thing that's relevant to you and, you, and these are working commissions. My friends on the Juvenile Justice Commission in Santa Clara County and they got the age changed when a kid gets sent from juvie to adult prison, they got it changed from 18 to 21. And now they're working on getting college, community college curriculum because they never had those older kids in there before. And those were real things that this volunteer commission that she got onto by asking in a very populous county, I might add. So don't wait till you think you're 100%. Go, go find the way you can participate. Okay, I've, I've been told this is our last question. Hi, I'm Janet Crawford. I do work on the biology of power. And I want to raise an issue that kind of cuts across age and race and ability, which is um, age covering for women. Because we are taught from a very young age that our currency decreases the older we get. And so there's a tremendous amount of effort and in an entire industry that is devoted to having women cover their age. And in fact, in the entertainment industry where I do a lot of consulting, I had a, a male executive tell me that it's easier for women to get into the executive ranks because look, there aren't any gray haired ones here. They get there younger, um, to which all the women started laughing. Um, <laughs> So I, I would love some commentary on how do we break out of this cycle of covering up our age and pretending that we're something that we're not. This is my conscious decision to go gray this year. Um, I was dark haired a year ago. Um, because I wanted to be a representative of who I am um, and represent other women of my age range. And so how can we support ourselves in doing that? I don't, I don't think that just because you don't ha have gray hair doesn't mean that you're represented, not representing your age, right? Because I'm, yeah, no, I, I'm just, I'm, my mom's Jamaican, I'm lucky, I have, you know, I'm, I'm 45, and my hair, this is my hair color, I had breast cancer two years ago, all my hair fell out, my hair grew back, and I decided that I didn't want to use chemicals in my hair, and I'm like, I used to have hair down my back. I lost it. I wore my head bald. I didn't wear weaves because that, that's, that's me. Um, I think that there, I'm never shy away from the age question. I think some of the stuff, again, I, I caution people to be cognizant of the stories inside your head where you are assuming that someone might be feeling a certain type of way. The man that's getting Botox probably age discriminates himself against the other women in the room. And therefore now he feels like he needs to look younger. Um, again, that goes to when I said, you know, you need to be careful of the beds that you make because then you have to lie in them, right? So even though the 60 year old on TV has a 25 year old girlfriend, I guarantee you, and you work in Hollywood a lot, they don't look like they look on TV when the camera stops rolling. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, it, you know, there's a the storytelling as a, as a craft and as a, is, is beautiful and it provides escapism, just like books, et cetera. But like the reality is, is you know, this, it, it's good to embrace who you are in this present moment and just be grateful that you're alive and like not worry about like those little things. Um, just, you know, be mindful. I think to your point, you keep saying that it starts with mindfulness and intention. intention. Yeah, also with regard to the bed you lie in um, and talking about ageism, uh, you know, the age expectancy is going up <laughs> uh, um, every year. Uh, it's pretty impressive. And as social tell, change takes time. So if people do not take uh, responsibility and are not accountable to, uh, to including people of all ages, uh, not too far ahead, <laughs> they will be that age, and they will be in a society that either includes people of that age or not. So uh, it's, it's a very conscious decision to think long term. 
Yeah, I mean, I stopped dyeing my hair a few years ago. Um, my mom still dyes her hair, and like it's a it's a huge question for the end of the panel because I think we're caught between the you do you and every person makes the decision and how can I tell someone else what steps to take and me saying oh I uh, the other one is um, like uh, I have curly hair right so all my life the princess flat irons her hair when she goes through that makeover right you know and so I'm all about like yeah don't straighten your hair don't dye your hair but who am I like to say that to anyone um, I think that when I do think there is a movement in the beauty industry to stop calling it like anti-aging and like because what's the alternative to aging? It's not good. Um, and so I think there's some awareness, but it's it's going to be slow. That's a big ass industry. I, when you talk about my favorite, which I use their products as well, is Shea Moisture's commercial about um, having the products in the ethnic section. Yes, multicultural. And I used to work in international and uh, I posted the commercial and my friends in Italy were like, that's not true, that that doesn't happen. I was like, yeah, exactly, <laughs> it, it, it actually does, it actually does. So I think, again, it goes back to like any conversation that you have around age, race, gender, it needs to just, it's a whole conversation. Yeah so much. So I think we're at the end of our time, uh, but we'll still be here for a little bit. Um, thank you so much for your great questions and for your perspective. And thank you to my panelists who are amazing, Maggie Avital and Christina. And thank you to AARP, hashtag Disrupt Aging. And thank you to The Atlantic. Thank you, Julissa. Thank you, Julissa.